Good afternoon. When supply chain managers or purchasing managers or company directors talk about strengthening supply chains, we mean that we're trying to build redundancy and also closeness. We want to move supply chains closer to where the customers are. We also want to build multiple suppliers in at key points of the supply chain. If I have a small grocery store that I'm buying for, and that's in a rural area, we hope to find multiple suppliers for dairy products and for eggs and for bread and meat. But in manufacturing, that is not nearly as simple as that, especially because China now controls so many key elements of every single supply chain in every single industry. So if we want to diversify away from China or reduce our dependency on China, it's just really hard to do. China is also far away from most of the buyers, and so it's very difficult to bring anything closer. But it is easy to talk about, and our political leaders and government officials and higher education and think tanks don't have any real experience in business or in industry to speak of, yet we pay attention to them anyway. And they talk about supply chains and friendshoring or de-risking or decoupling from China because those are great buzzwords now that everyone likes to use. And they like to point out how supply chains have shifted away from China and into places like Vietnam or Mexico, which is just what they wanted to have happen when they enacted all these tariffs and put all these import regulations in place. But now the real world financial data are coming in and the conclusion is that there's been no real world decoupling at all. The supply chains are simply lengthening instead of deepening. They're getting longer instead of stronger. It's still China. We're just adding another stop or two along the way and pretending we're buying from someone else, but we're not. And it's naturally costing a lot more to do all this. And instead of worrying about what might happen in the future with China, now we have to worry about what might happen in the future with Mexico and China and with Vietnam and with China. That's more currency risk, more political risk, more logistics risk. We're adding more complexity and more uncertainty instead of less. The Wall Street Journal has two strong features on this that we will link to. And both of them have relied on this study from the Bank for International Settlements or BIS. The Bank for International Settlements is just what it sounds like. They see where all the money is really going in international trade. So a US buyer who was buying from China, but who is now buying from Mexico, the BIS can see that the money went to a company in Mexico, which then bought critical components from China, just like they were doing before. It says made in Mexico on the box, but the bank knows that the parts came from China to Mexico and a company in Mexico, a Chinese company usually, just put them into a different box. The supply chain resiliency that we think we're getting lately is not really there. And the chains now are getting more risky too. Policymakers look at this chart here and they see that China's exports to the EU and the US are dropping since 2018. But other and Southeast Asia are rising since 2018. And then they conclude that the other countries are replacing China. But what's happening instead is that China's shipping parts to other countries, assembling them there and shipping them to the developed world instead. They've lengthened since 2021, but they've not gotten more dense. The number of suppliers is the same. We're just adding a Vietnam in the middle and pretending we're friendshoring something or de-risking. That means that the systems of global supply chains are more complex without being more beneficial in any way. And it's especially true in electronics and in high value added industries. The Center for Economic Policy Research saw a direct correlation between the shift to Vietnam and the cost of US shipments from there. Researchers in Dartmouth noted the same thing when they studied trade data over a six year period. So this lack of transparency, as well as this belief in a fiction of friendshoring, will pose another problem later for policymakers. Will Washington 
or the European Union sanctioned Chinese companies that are now operating in Mexico or in Vietnam or in East Europe. The Chinese companies go to other countries and they hire Mexicans or Hungarians, for example, and they pay taxes in those countries. So what would our policy response be if by sanctioning Chinese companies in friendly countries, we are putting Mexicans or Europeans out of jobs? Let's go now to the survey by the Bank for International Settlements from last October, and their summary is here. Takeaway number one, global value chains are getting longer, but without adding new suppliers or any new real diversification. Takeaway number two, that this is especially true for China-US trade relationships, where China simply sets up a new company in other Asian countries to handle the business. The BIS built their study by looking at direct and indirect linkages in supply chains. If company A supplies company B, which then supplies company C, they call this a two-step indirect linkage from A to C. Then they studied thousands of ordered pairs and measured distances between the first supplier and the final buyer and concluded that almost all the supply chain moves here have been just interposing a new middleman between supplier and buyer. The BIS points out again that this is particularly true in IT. The share of Chinese companies that are now direct suppliers to the United States is falling. But when you consider the indirect links, all they're doing is interposing another company in between to get around the tariffs. And all we're doing is pretending that this isn't happening. We are grateful to the Wall Street Journal for putting this study for the BIS into plain English. A huge volume of the products shipped into the United States from Southeast Asia and from Mexico are from Chinese factories. And these products wouldn't be made. They couldn't be made without the Chinese doing it. Diversification of the supply chains is not happening much if it's happening at all. It's just become a lot more complicated. And our dependency is still on China, but now we're also dependent on, for example, China's relationship with Thailand too. And of course, we're paying more for that privilege. Using Thailand again as an example, the US buyer is still buying from China, who ships the parts to Thailand for assembly and shipment to the United States. The supply chain got longer, farther away, China to Thailand to the US, and it just got more risky and more expensive. This is Heilongjiang province from North China. Be good. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you for this precious day of grace coming. 